Brother David Roper is the speaker for this session. And Brother Roper is a very special individual uh, to this congregation for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that he served as the pulpit preacher here for a number of years back in the 1980s and was uh, very instrumental in uh, the beginning of the Truth and Love television program. There will be a little bit uh, more said about that uh, at the luncheon today that we uh, invite and encourage you to attend in which uh, Brother Roper is going to be one of three men uh, that are going to be honored uh, at that luncheon and uh, uh, to whom uh, the lectureship book is dedicated. And so he's a very special uh, individual and we are happy to have him here. Uh, the honor that is being paid to him uh, and to Jack Orbison uh, and to Eddie Parker is honor that's deserved. And uh, we're happy that he's here to uh, proclaim uh, the truth of God's Word to us. A little bit of background information. Uh, he has preached the gospel for over 50 years uh, in various uh, uh, places, including the states uh, not only of Texas, but also Oklahoma and Arkansas. Uh, for 10 years, he and his family did the Lord's work in Australia. Brother Roper is uh, not only an accomplished speaker, but an accomplished writer as well. He's written a number of books, uh, including six volumes in uh, the Truth For Today commentary series that is still in the process of being uh, completed. Uh, Brother Coy Roper as well, who led the prayer a moment ago, has also authored uh, some in that series. And uh, I, for one, have benefited greatly from Brother uh, David's writings, his little booklet on the on the book of James called Practical Christianity. My copy of that is falling apart uh, because I have uh, consulted it so many times. Matter of fact, I'm planning to preach a series of lessons this year here at Brown Trail on the book of James and have already gotten his booklet out and have been consulting it and will be uh, in the future in preparing those lessons. And I'm sure that a lot of you could make similar statements and how you've benefited from his writings. And uh, we're grateful that he's here. David and his wife, Joe presently live in Midwest City, Oklahoma, as he continues to work there and serve the Lord in a number of capacities. His topic this morning, what is the new birth? I invite your attention to our brother, David Roper. It's good to be with you this morning. It's hard to... Uh really realize it's been about 20 years since I was in this pulpit. I would say that time flies when you're having fun, but when you reach my age, you know that it flies whether you're having fun or not. <laughs> Amen? My topic uh, as given to me uh, was exactly what is the new birth. We of course see these signs, you must be born again. And I always wonder what the unchurched think those signs mean. Uh, for a period of time at uh, football games, when they would be lining up to kick the uh, field goal back behind the goals, there was somebody would hold up a sign, John 3 or John, uh, John 3, 3 or John 3, 5. I tried for a while to get the ministry of going to football games and holding up Acts 2.38. Couldn't find anybody that would support me in that ministry. But you, you hear all of these things. You hear about born-again Christians. And I, I, I know that people must really wonder what that phrase means. Well, that's my topic this morning. What is the new birth? Now, in your books, you have uh, this topic, as I might approach it in a lectureship. I thought this is kind of late in the lectureship. You've been sitting there uh, for many hours, most of you. And so I thought I would approach this like I would approach it if I were preaching. Is that all right? As I would approach it as a sermon. Let me begin with a riddle. Do you like riddles? Here's a simple riddle. Some people are born once and will die twice. 
Some people are born twice and will only die once. Our topic is the new birth, and our primary text is going to be in John chapter 3. If you'll be turning there, please. While I was preaching here at Brown Trail, I heard many stories about Brother Roy Deaver and his preaching here. And someone told me that on occasion he used children's blocks as memory devices. And I thought that might be interesting to try this morning. So that's John 3. That's that incident. Have you turned there? John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Elsewhere we learned that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. The same came to Jesus by night. Now this obviously is a significant uh, phrase because it's found every time that Nicodemus is mentioned. But we don't know exactly what it means. Maybe he didn't want others to know he was there. Maybe that was a convenient time. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles except which th that thou doest, except God be with him. Now, people were getting excited. Jesus had come preaching the kingdom is at hand, even as his predecessor John the Baptist had. And, and kingdom fires were being rekindled, and, and people were wondering whether or not Jesus was that king, was that Messiah who would set up that messianic kingdom. And so he says, teacher, you're doing these miracles. No man can do those except God be with him. Verse 3, Jesus answered. And he's not answering the words that he spoke, but perhaps he looked in his heart and saw that interest in the kingdom. And Jesus wanted to teach him something about the kingdom. And said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, the term translated again could be translated anew or even from above. All of those are acceptable translations. But he's emphasizing there has to be another birth. You've experienced one. But now there has to be another birth if you're going to see the kingdom of God. Now you and I understand that uh, Jesus was preparing the way for the establishment of the church. Matthew 16 and verse 18 and 19 uses those terms, kingdom and church, interchangeably. But right here, he's just trying to emphasize the nature of that kingdom. The Jews were looking forward to a kingdom that could be experienced with the five senses a physical kingdom. And Jesus wanted him to understand now, that's not the kind of kingdom that's going to be established. This is a kingdom that has to be entered through a spiritual birth. Verse 4, Nicodemus is mightily uh, uh, shaken up. He, he doesn't understand. He's perplexed. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. For just a moment, compare verse 3 and verse 5. Notice the parallels. Verse 3, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again. Verse 5 Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Being born again is the same as being born of water and the Spirit. I mention that because sometimes people want to speak of two births in verse 5. Natural birth and then a spiritual birth. But Jesus is speaking only of one birth with two aspects. Born of water and of the Spirit. Notice also the comparison on the end. He said he cannot see the kingdom of God in verse 3. and verse 5, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So seeing the kingdom of God is the same as entering 
the kingdom of God, becoming a citizen of God's kingdom. It continues on in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, Nicodemus had become a Jew by being born physically. I became an American by being born physically. But that is being born of the flesh. Now he talks about his emphasis at the last part of verse 6, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. It's a spiritual kingdom that's going to be entered by a spiritual birth. Verse 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, that you must be born again. And then he uses an illustration in verse 8 of the wind. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. Now, I happen to live in a land with a lot of wind. I remember also that you on occasion have the wind here. And, and we see it pick up the dirt. We see it uh, push trees over and sometimes down. We even see it pick up houses on occasion. But you don't see that airflow itself that's called the wind. And so he's saying the kingdom is not something that you're going to experience with these senses. The kingdom is a spiritual kingdom that must be entered by a spiritual birth. So he continues on, uh, you cannot tell where it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the spirit. And notice he doesn't say so is the process of being born of the spirit, but so is everyone that is born. It is a spiritual birth experienced by the spirit of man. Now, for our purposes, I want to go back and emphasize the necessity of this new birth. Notice that he says in verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse, verse 5, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. There uh, is no question about it. This is not an optional matter. If you desire to be a citizen in the kingdom, you must be born again anew. You must be born from above. Now that's John chapter 3. And I want you to, 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 to really uh, note in your mind how important the new birth is. And as important as Jesus made the new birth, we might expect this to be a part of everything that's said from that point on. Let's make a little journey. John chapter 3 is near the beginning of the uh, personal ministry of Jesus Christ. He hasn't had the great Galilean ministry the, the last uh, week and so on. That, that's somewhat near the first. So we make a journey through the ministry of Jesus looking for additional teaching on the new birth, and we don't find it. We come to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Still silence. But finally we come to the period of time after his resurrection, while he's on the, new, uh, while he's on the earth, before he ascends back to his Father, and just before his ascension, he gives what we know as the Great Commission. Turn with me to Mark the 16th chapter, verse 15 and 16. Mark the 16th chapter, verse 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to every creature. He that is born again shall be saved, but he that is not born again shall be damned. Now, I, I know it's Wednesday morning. You've been sitting for a long time. I'm just trying to see if you're, if you're still awake out there. Does it read like that? We might expect it to. But instead, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. We turn over a few more pages to Acts, the second chapter. The gospel is going to be preached in its fullness for the first time. Peter stands up and he begins to preach about Jesus Christ. People are pricked in their hearts, verse 37. They cry unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Now verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be born again, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Are, are, you, are you checking me as I go through these passages? He doesn't mention the new birth. He said over here, you must be born again. If you're going to be a citizen in the kingdom, there uh, is no doubt about it. This is not an optional matter. But when Peter preaches a sermon for the first time, he says, repent, verse 38, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. We continue our journey through the book of Acts. We see so many great gospel sermons preached, no mention of the new birth. We hear people told what to do in order to be saved, no mention of the new birth. Uh, one example, for instance, might be in Acts, the 22nd chapter. In Acts chapter 9, 22, and 26, we have the accounts of the conversion of Saul. Saul saw the Lord on the road. Uh, the Lord told him to go into the city. There it would be told him what he must do. And in Acts, the 22nd chapter, finally in verse 16, a preacher comes to him. And the preacher says to him, and now why tarriest thou, arise and be born again, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You're starting to catch on here, right? Preacher didn't say be born again. What did he say? And now why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now that raises this question. Jesus said you must be born again. There's no... Uh, Doubt at all what Jesus was talking about there. You have to do that. Uh, but then he said, believe him to be baptized. Peter, preaching the gospel for the first time, said, repent and be baptized. The preacher told, uh, told Saul, arise and be baptized. The question is, since the new birth is so important, were these individuals born again? Let's go to uh, 1 Peter. This is the individual that uh, preached the gospel there in, in Acts chapter 2. And let's notice what he said in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 22 and 23. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Listen to it now. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the, as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of God endureth forever. This is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Now notice in verse 2 he said, You have purified your souls in obeying the truth. And then as a result, what happened? Verse 23, being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Just in passing, we notice that the, the Greek word for seed is sperma, kind of ties in with that whole germination process, uh, that whole begetting process. Many passages emphasize that we're, we're begotten by the word of God. Paul said, you know, I have begotten you through the gospel. Now, I want you to think of the process that he's talking about here. Notice verse 25, the gospel was preached. The word of God, the seed, was thus planted in their hearts. When that seed was conceived, when that, when that seed germinated, when that seed uh, brought forth something, it was obedience. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth. As a result, they were born again. In other words, when Saul was told to arise and be baptized, when he did that, he was born again. 
when people on the day of Pentecost repented, were baptized, they were born again. When people did what Jesus said here, uh, believed and were baptized, they were born again. Uh, there's a two-part answer, really, to the question, what is the new birth? And the first part is, it's another way of speaking of conversion. Another way of speaking of conversion. Remember, Jesus said you must be born of water and the Spirit. Let's go to Acts 2 for just a moment. And I want you to listen carefully and see if you can see anything about water and Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Let's back up to Acts chapter 1. The, the apostles are concerned about the kingdom, just like Nicodemus was concerned about the kingdom. They said, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They have in mind a physical kingdom. They don't really understand yet the nature of the kingdom. Jesus tells them uh, to, to go and and Terry in the city of Jerusalem are going to be endued with, with power from on high. The power is going to come when the Holy Spirit comes. And way back in Mark, he had said the, uh, the kingdom is going to come with power. You go wait in the city of Jerusalem so that the power will come, uh, the Spirit will come, the kingdom will come, uh, the church will be established. Now beginning in Acts, the cha uh, second chapter, first part, the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles. The Holy Spirit enables the apostles to begin to preach by inspiration. Peter begins to preach that spirit-inspired word, and he preaches on Jesus Christ. When people cry out, what shall we do? Peter says to them, verse 38, repent and be baptized. The word baptized means immersed. And in context, it's immersed in water. Repent and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. Verse 41, they that gladly received his word were immersed in water, were baptized. And the Lord added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. He translated them, if you please, into the kingdom. They became citizens of the kingdom. Verse 47, they became uh, members of the church of the Lord. He added them to the, to the church. Now, I don't know if you, you were listening there. Did you hear that word spirit a few times? Did you hear that word water a few times? Born of water and the spirit as we are born again, as we become citizens in the kingdom, as we become members of the body of Jesus Christ. And so the first part of the answer, uh, of the question, uh, answering the question is, it's another way of speaking of the process of conversion. Now, some folks don't like that. That's, that's too simple. It needs to be a, a more mysterious thing. They say, after all, it's, it's like the wind as it mentions there in John chapter 3. Well, I've already said I, I'm from the land where the wind comes sweeping down the plain. And uh, we think of the wind in various ways. Uh, we think of it as obnoxious on occasion. Uh, we think of it as irritating. We think of it as scary. Sometimes we think of it as terrifying. I've never heard an oaky apply the adjective mysterious to the wind. Now, the wind's not a mysterious thing. And, of course, I understand out in West Texas they would apply the word profitable to the wind. But it's not mysterious. But it, it, it doesn't bother me to think of the new birth as bordering on the mysterious. I happen to be a man. I, I know that hopefully is obvious. But, but I happen to be a guy. And birth, to me, borders on the mysterious. I'm one of these guys that when finally I held that little baby in my arms, I said to my wife, you were pregnant, weren't you? Uh, I just, I can't, you know, I can't grasp it. I can't fathom it. But isn't a birth awe-inspiring? Isn't it mind-boggling? It's just such a marvelous thing, whether it is 
a physical birth or a spiritual birth. But listen to me. Even though physical birth is so amazing, so astonishing, we still know how it happens, and we can still point to a time when it happens, right? And even so, the spiritual birth, it's amazing, it's astonishing. All of us can, 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 can either talk about our own conversion or the conversion of others, amazing changes that took place in the lives of individuals. But we still know how it happens as the word is preached, as we believe, as we repent, as we confess, as we're baptized, and, and God has seen fit to make there a point in time, our baptism coming forth to newness of life, that we can point to and say, that is the moment of birth. So it's another way of speaking of conversion. Matthew 18, 3, Jesus said, except you be converted, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Here in John 3, except you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So the terms are used interchangeably. But that brings up another question. If it's basically another way of speaking of conversion, why didn't Jesus just say, except a man be converted, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, in the first place, it fit his purpose of talking about the spiritual nature of the kingdom. It also, though, teaches some additional lessons concerning our conversion. Uh, we've already talked about the fact it's amazing. And I'd like to suggest it gives us an added dimension. So my, my part two answer is it's another way of speaking of conversion that adds a new dimension to our understanding and appreciation of the conversion process. The word conversion means change. Uh, a piece of leather is converted into a shoe. But birth is not just a change, is it? It's a dramatic change. Uh, it, it, it's even a radical change. Now, as, as time allows, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about that aspect of, of the new birth. What a person who is born again looks like. What kind of effect this should have on our lives. Now, in the book, I give a number of things, but I want to just concentrate on one thing here for a few moments. I want to talk about the dramatic change that should take place in the life of someone who is born again. Turn with me, if you will, to, to 1 John. Now, 1 John has a whole lot to say about the matter of being born again, being born of God. In fact, if I count it correctly, there are some 10 references to being born uh, of God in the book of 1 John. And as, 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 as John is writing, and he's writing near the end of the first century, way back here, the same guy that, said, that wrote this down in John 3, that uh, th those events took place many years earlier. But here in 1 John, near the end of the first century, John is combating some false doctrines. There are people that taught that Jesus that walked upon the earth was not the, was not the Christ, was not the Messiah. And as he's combating that, he, he talks about uh, the, the, the true nature of Jesus Christ and all of that. But he's also vitally concerned about the matter of relationships. And he's concerned about a man's relationship with God. He's concerned about a man's relationship with his brother. And he's concerned about a man's relationship to the world. Now, these Gnostics, as we sometimes call them, these people that thought they had this special knowledge who were teaching these false doctrines, they affected a man's relationship with God and with Jesus because of their false teaching. False teaching will always affect your relationship with God. Because they thought they had knowledge other people didn't have, this affected their relationship with their brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. In fact, their false teaching many times split churches. And so relationship with God, relationship with, uh, with the brother, all of these were affected. One practical result of their false teaching was that they said anything goes. Uh, the, the, the grace of God's going to cover anything, and so as far as the world is concerned, 
you can do what the world wants you to do. Now keep all of that in mind as we go now to the passages in 1 John that speak of being born of God. John has many threads in the book, but three of the principal threads in the book are going to be righteousness, love, and obedience. And these three threads are just going to intertwine into this rich tapestry that's known as 1 John. Okay, let's look at the first passage, 1 John, the second chapter, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, that's God is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Now, John's point that he's going to make is, you have been born of God, therefore, to borrow a phrase from, from, uh, from Peter, since you've been born of God, you should have partaken of the divine nature. You should be like your father. Did you ever hear a woman say, I've ended up just like my mother. Uh, well, I've ended up just like my dad. Now, now, now physically, I'm after my, my mom's side, but uh, as far as personality and uh, so on, temperament, I'm... I'm, I'm like my father. Well, spiritually, spiritually, we're to be like our father. Now, notice, you know that God is righteous. And if you know that, you know that everyone that doeth righteous, that does right, is born of him. He's talking about what a man who is born again looks like. A man who is born again does what is right. He's concerned about it. He doesn't think everything goes. He's concerned about what is right and what is wrong. Look at the third chapter, verses 9 and 10. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And I know I'm speaking to a group of people that understand he's using present tense. He's talking about continuous action. Whosoever is born of God does not continually commit sin. We're all going to sin. We don't live a sinful lifestyle, for his seed remaineth in him. And that could have several uh, meanings. In one translation says his nature uh, remains in him, such as that divine nature that we're to be partakers of. But the simplest explanation is just keep it like it was in the new birth itself. Uh, the word of God remains in him. He's continuing to study and that word is continuing to go down into his heart. It remains in him. And so he's not going to live that sinful lifestyle. And he cannot sin. He cannot continue to sin. Cannot live that uh, sinful lifestyle. Why? Because he's born of God. And this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Just, just two kinds of children. You're either a child of God and are living as God wants you to live. You're partaking of the nature of God are you a child of the devil and partaking of the nature of the devil? Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Now notice as these threads begin to intertwine, neither he that loveth not his brother. I know there are individuals that think they can love God and then you know, treat their brothers hatefully. But John says, no, 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 these, these are intertwined. You're in the family of God. Because you're in the family of God, not only do you love God, but you love the others whom God has begotten. You love your brothers and sisters. Uh, that brings us to the fourth chapter, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, love does not define God, but God does define love. God's love is a sacrificial love. God's love held nothing back. And, and since we are sons of God, children of God, born of God, we need to have that kind of love. Many years ago, when we lived in Australia, by a strange series of coincidences, I found myself preaching one night for a congregation that hated Americans. And so as I was standing before them and preaching, that I, I began with one strike against me. 
Now, my topic was a new birth, and, and, and we got along fine as long as I was talking about the fact it's another way of speaking of the conversion process. They were nodding their heads. But this happened to be a congregation that believed that when you had a lectureship that was a, quote, evangelistic service, and you were to address only outsiders, non-members of the body of Christ. You were never to say anything that would apply to members of the church. But I looked out at my audience, and there was not a single non-member present. And so I decided on the spot, I need to talk about what a born-again individual looks like. And I began to preach to the church, strike two. Finally, I got down to 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. And I said, I have to love you, and you have to love me. In Christ Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, Australian or American, for all one in Jesus Christ. Strike three. <laughs> Out of there. Well, it was not the uh, uh, most tactful thing I ever said under the circumstances, but I believe that's right. I believe we need to love each other. And if you go through 1 John, he's going to tell you what that means. Your brother has need, what? You help your brother. He emphasizes if you don't love one, you can't love the other, regardless of which way you go. Well, let's tie up this in, in, in chapter 5. He, uh, in the first five verses especially, blends together so many of these threads. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, that's God, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Notice how it goes back and forth. If you love God, you're what? You're going to love the children of God. But if you love the children of God, you're going to love God, and one expression of that is to keep his commandments. Verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. We are concerned about what is right and what is wrong. We're not going to give in to the pull of the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. This is the family of God. And love should prevail. And anything that would try to destroy that family must be opposed by us, must be resisted by us. My brother, uh, uh, Coy, was uh, introduced a short time ago. And my brother and I take little jabs at each other. Everybody know what I'm talking about, of you brothers and sisters? And, uh, for instance, uh, they're, just, they're just the two Roper boys. Some people are thankful for that. But there's just the two Roper boys. I'm the oldest. He's the youngest. So my story is that they looked at me when I was born and said, that's just so wonderful. Let's try again. And they looked at Coy when he was born and said, that's it. We're not going to try anymore. Now, now, Coy's version is they looked at me when I was born and said, I think we can do better than that. Then he was born, they said, okay, that's perfect. Well, anyway, we, we take a little playful jabs, but listen to me, folks. You better not take any jabs at my brother. He's family. He's family. Here's the family of God. We've been born of God, and it changes us. It makes us new individuals. Well, one last passage uh, in, in verse 8, uh, verse 18, rather, chapter 5. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, does not continue to sin. But he that is begotten of God keeps himself, guards himself by keep doing what is right, by keeping on loving God, keeping on loving his brother, keeping on obeying God. And as a result, the wicked one touches him not. Well, let's go back uh, as time allows here for just a minute to my little riddle. You've got it figured out. Some individuals are born once, going to die twice. Some are born twice, just going to die once. Of course, that second birth is the, is the new birth that we've been talking about. And I'm sure you've guessed by now that that second death is the one talked about in the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation 2.10, we know the first part of it, but the last part's important too. 
he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Then chapter 20 and 21 speaks of the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Folks, I don't want to have that second death. Amen? I don't want any part of that second death. I want to be born again. I want to live like an individual that's born again so that God may give me the victory. May God help us all.